Hello, students, and welcome back to Poly 101, the Government of Canada. I'm Sam, your instructor. As you recall, last week we discussed Canadian Confederation and political culture. We looked at the differences between Canadian political culture and American political culture. We also looked at the differences between French and English Canadians, not only in terms of their share of the Canadian demography, but also in terms of their distinct political cultures. Today, we are going to expand on those ideas by focusing on French-English relations. To fully understand Canadian government and politics, it's absolutely essential to engage with the topic of French-English relations. You'll notice that in our assigned readings, we've jumped all the way from chapter two to chapter 14. Our Brooks text on Canadian democracy waits until chapter 14 to talk about language politics. This was too long of a wait for me. I think it's absolutely essential to put this material at the front of our semester so that we can have a good basis for understanding the issues in Canadian politics and government that we'll go on to discuss later in the term. The relationship between Francophones and Anglophones in Canada is a dynamic that has changed over the centuries. It began with Anglophone minority domination of a Francophone majority. The demographic picture has changed over the centuries, as we'll see in today's lecture. And now, more contemporaneously, despite decades of linguistic policies that have promoted French language and culture and the Quebecois nation, we still see a fear that the Francophone Canadians are diminishing and that their language rights might be challenged in the future. But the issue of Quebecois separatism seems to be less popular than it has been at various critical junctures in Canadian history, like 1980 and 1995. We're going to explore all of these issues today as we understand the crucial interaction between French and English Canadians. Before we proceed to our learning objectives for today's lecture, I'd like to pose a guiding question. What is political community? Our textbook provides a definition which is far from complete, but is helpful for today's purposes. A political community, according to Brooks, is a shared sense of belonging to a country whose territorial integrity is worth preserving. This territorial integrity aspect we are going to focus on not just today, but also in next week's lecture. And this is because the Canadian political community faces two significant challenges to its territorial integrity. First, Indigenous demands for self-government. This is a topic that we will cover in full in next week's lecture. Second, and relevant to today's lecture, the management of French-English relations. This topic today is so important for understanding the Canadian political community, its shared sense of national purpose, and its destiny. The management of French-English relations has been a crucial issue underlining Canadian politics ever since the Seven Years' War in 1756. With that in mind, we have four learning objectives that we are going to accomplish today. First, we're going to describe the historical and current developments in the size and distribution of Canada's Francophone population. We know that the Francophone population is concentrated in Quebec, but its overall size has fluctuated from being a large majority to a significant minority today. Next, we're going to identify the chief characteristics of what we can call traditional French Canadian nationalism. And then we're going to examine how the quiet revolution transformed this traditional nationalism into a new type of Quebecois politics and nationalism beginning in the 1960s and extending to the present day. Third, we're going to understand the status of Canada's linguistic policies. We're going to do this by comparing Quebec's unilingual approach with Ottawa's bilingual approach to official language policies. Finally, we're going to examine the recent decline in support for Quebecois separatism, and we'll consider whether this is an issue that has been settled 
or whether it will continue to have a political future in Quebecois and national Canadian politics. As we discussed last week, the conflict between French and English-speaking Canadians dates all the way back to the Seven Years' War and the conquest of 1759, in which New France was transferred to British control after the military defeat of French forces in the Plains of Abraham. When this happened, a sudden transformation occurred. The French-speaking Catholic colonists suddenly found that they were no longer in charge of their political destiny. They outnumbered English-speaking Canadians at the time eight to one, and yet they would find themselves ruled by a minority who did not share their language, religion, or cultural traditions. Fast forwarding to Confederation, we would see that the differences between French and English Canadians, though their demogra demographic differences were beginning to shrink, the policy differences remain significant. Some of the issues that have divided French and English Canadians since Confederation include Canada's participation in World War I, where Quebec was strongly anti-war and opposed Canada's entry into the war. And then with World War II, Quebec was not as anti-war, but it opposed the draft. It opposed conscription in both of those wars as a federal overreach into Quebecois sovereignty. We've also seen significant battles over French language education rights, especially in Ontario and in Manitoba, where a significant Supreme Court case established the French language rights in that province. And very significantly, since 1976, support in Quebec for independence for separation from Canada has ranged between a low of around 20%, which is where it hovers today, and a high of 60%. And in fact, Quebec on two occasions held referenda to determine whether they should separate from Canada in 1980 and in 1995. Both of these were very close votes, but the 1995 vote was razor thin and bears looking at a little more closely. The 1995 referendum on Quebec independence posed the following question to Quebecers. Do you agree that Quebec should become sovereign after having made a formal offer to Canada for a new economic and political partnership? The vote was extremely close, with the no vote coming in at 50.58%, compared to a yes vote of 49.42%. This was so close and much closer than the 1980 referendum, which in its own right was also a close race. Let's take a closer look at how Quebec voted. You can see on the left-hand side of this map the entire province of Quebec, and you can see a pretty even split between the two colors, red for no, blue for yes, and separation. We can also look at an enlarged view of some of the more densely populated areas in Quebec. For instance, if we look on the bottom row, we can see that in Quebec City, the vote was heavily in favor of yes and separation from Canada. Whereas in Montreal, we see much larger numbers of voters who voted to stay in Canada, who voted no. But if we look at South Quebec, we see an overall picture of the province where or at least we see a microcosm of the provincial vote where we see a nearly even split between the two sides. Much has changed since 1995 in terms of public support for Quebecois separatism. We're going to return to this issue at the end of today's lecture to see if there is still an appetite for separatism and whether this is an issue that has a political future. French-English relations in Canada have typically been characterized by a tradition of elite accommodation, and this has usually worked. What do I mean by elite accommodation? I mean cooperation and even political partnership by political elites from the different power centers of Canada, 
specifically the historical power centers of Anglophone Canada, centered in Ontario, and Francophone Canada, centered in Quebec. We can look all the way back to the pre-Confederation political partnership between John A. Macdonald and Georges Etienne Cartier. Macdonald would go on to become the first Canadian Prime Minister, and Cartier was an important political leader of the Québécois. And if not for their friendship and political partnership, Canadian Confederation might never have become a reality. If you'd like to learn more about these two figures, as well as the birth of Canadian Confederation, check out the movie John A. Birth of a Country, which is available for free on YouTube. It discusses the elite accommodation that happened in the 10 years leading up to Confederation, and it focuses on three political figures, MacDonald, Cartier, and the conservative politician and founder of the Toronto Globe, George Brown. Now, all the way from Confederation to the present day, this practice of elite accommodation has usually worked to resolve issues between French and English Canadians. The most notable failure of this process was the October Crisis of 1970. This is also known as the FLQ Crisis, when a radical separatist Quebecois group kidnapped prominent politicians, and it resulted in the declaration of martial law. This is also known as the October Crisis. Despite centuries of tensions and the flare-up of the October Crisis in 1970, what we really should notice is that French and English Canadians are still living under the same constitution. They're still sending politicians to the same parliament more than 150 years after they entered into a confederation despite their linguistic, cultural differences. We can also see that French and English Canadians have voted for the same leaders on multiple occasions, although in almost every instance, these leaders are representing Quebec. But these include Wilfrid Laurier, Mackenzie King, Brian Mulroney, Jean Chrétien, and both Pierre and Justin Trudeau, who you see pictured here. Let's proceed to our first learning objective for the day which is to describe the current and historical trends in the demographics of language politics, specifically the size and concentration of Francophone and to a lesser extent bilingual speakers in Canada. We begin, of course, with the conquest of 1759 and the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763, when Francophones outnumbered Anglophones by about eight to one. Despite this numerical advantage, Francophones were about to begin two centuries of domination by an Anglophone minority. Although, to be more precise, it wasn't two centuries of domination by a minority. Because by 1871, which was the year of the first census in Canada, Anglophones now outnumbered Francophones. By 1871, Canadians of French origin comprised only about one-third of the population. Furthermore, fast forwarding to today, we see that Francophone's share of the Canadian population is now down to an all-time low of just over 21%. What accounts for this decline in the size of the Francophone population relative to the Anglophone population? The major explanation for this is that immigrants overwhelmingly adopt English as their new language when they come to Canada. However, we also can remark that birth rates have dropped dramatically in Quebec. Birth rates across Canada, for that matter, have dropped dramatically, but we've seen them decline even more sharply in Quebec, especially compared to the historical numbers of, in terms of total fertility rate that Quebec was demonstrating in the previous century and a half. On the next slide, we're going to take a look at a couple of graphs that depict this change in fertility rates in Quebec, Canada, and also in a couple of other countries for comparative perspective. First, let's look at Quebec compared to Canada, the United States, France, and England and Wales in terms of a measure known as total fertility rate. 
And if we look at the total fertility rate from 1931 to 1996, we see the general trend of decline across all of these advanced democracies, which is typical of most advanced democracies during this period. However, when we focus on the solid black line that represents the total fertility rate of Quebec, we notice that it starts from a high point at four, much higher than the rest of the other countries represented here, and yet it then falls to a position below all of them by 1996. And so an exceptionally high Quebecois birth rate helped prop up the relative size of the Francophone population in Canada relative to the Anglophone population, which was growing at an even larger rate, largely because of immigration, but also, as we can see, because of a relatively high birth rate represented by the Canadian solid gray line on this map. And if we zoom in on the more current period of 1981 to 2011, and we now turn our focus from an international comparative perspective to a comparative perspective looking at the provinces and their total fertility rates, we see that Quebec has maintained a lower position relative to the other provinces across most of this period with a low point in the late 1980s for their fertility rate in Quebec. However, now we see that Quebec has rebounded somewhat with its fertility rate, which is only below Alberta, and which, at least in 2011, was higher than British Columbia and Ontario. Nonetheless, what we have seen is a sharp decline in the relative size of the Francophone population due to immigrants selecting English when they moved to Canada, and a decline in the overall birth rate in Quebec, compared not only internationally, but to other provinces within the country. For its part, Quebec's provincial government has done its best to pass language laws that will maintain the vitality and strength of the French language in Quebec. First, Provincial laws require that immigrants to Quebec send their children to French schools. In Quebec, Montreal is the most popular destination city for immigrants. Provincial laws also require that French is the sole official language for provincial public services. We'll see how this unilingual policy is different from the bilingual policy employed by Ottawa in the federal services in the entire country. But provincial services, the public services, are provided solely in French. Also, provincial language laws promote the use of French in Quebec's economy. We can take an example of signage laws. There was a law in Quebec that in the 1980s said that all signs for businesses must be in French only and that English language signs were not allowed. This was challenged and a Supreme Court case held that Quebec had to modify these laws. So today what we see is that all prominent signage is in French, but ancillary smaller signs, especially on the interior of restaurants and interior of businesses can be in English. Despite these and other efforts to maintain the strength and presence and prominence of the French language in Quebec, evidence shows that many allophones, and these are people whose native language is neither English, French, nor an indigenous language, allophones still opt for English in increasing numbers. And outside Quebec, with the exception of New Brunswick and Ontario, the Francophone populations of other provinces are very small. Roughly 3% of Canadians outside of Quebec report French as their first language or mother tongue. Let's take a look at a slide that we saw last week about the demographic distribution of French, English, and bilingual speakers across Canada. What we see here confirms what we already know. The concentration of Francophone individuals in Quebec is clear, with nearly 7 million French speakers in Quebec and 3.5 million bilingual speakers in Quebec. We see that Quebec is the seat, the center of the French and bilingual speakers of Canada. 
However, significant numbers of Francophone individuals live in Ontario and New Brunswick, especially where that makes up a relative, significant relative proportion of the population of New Brunswick. But like we've also seen a small portion of Francophone speakers and a small portion of bilingual speakers live across the other provinces. This graph shows the changes over the last century or so in the proportion of the Canadian population that speaks English, French, or another language. And if we look specifically at the post-war period after 1945, what we notice is a clear trend, a slight gradual increase in the proportion of English speakers, a slight gradual increase in the proportion of speakers of other languages, and a decrease during that time in the proportion of French speakers in Canada. Now, some of the estimates in the 1970s about the decline of the French speaking population were even more dire than what we have actually seen. Although the number of French speakers sits at an all time low of just over 21% today, we see that it has not disappeared like the people in the 1970s were worried that it might. Of course, much of this is to do with proactive linguistic policies, both on the part of the provincial government of Quebec, as well as the federal government of Ottawa's bilingual policies. And we'll explore all of this later in today's lecture. Let's say a few more words about bilingualism before we move past this first objective for today's lecture. Now, in all of the provinces except for Quebec, the French language community continuously loses some of its members to the English majority, usually younger generations. This is a process of English assimilation by French speaking individuals. Now, there is an exception to this, and it's known as the bilingual belt. And it is a narrow region running from Moncton, New Brunswick to the in the east to Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario in the west. And across this concentrated area known as the bilingual belt, where most of the Francophone speakers in Canada live, we see that the rates of English assimilation among all generations of French speakers is significantly lower. In the bilingual belt, people retain their French language skills. And bilingual out, bilingualism outside of Quebec has been increasing in recent years, and it's actually highest among the younger generations. However, the rates outside of, outside of Quebec are still quite low. The rapid expansion of French immersion schools, whether they are year long or summer programs, since the 1980s, this expansion, particularly in Ontario, where over half of all French immersion students live, this has helped. But unfortunately, as we will see, retention rates of French language, even through immersion programs, are quite low. The evidence on French immersion education in Canada suggests that decades of this type of education have produced what we can call a wave of receptive bilinguals. Receptive bilinguals are people who can respond to French communications, but do not themselves initiate conversations in French or consume French language media, or use French in the home, or use French principally as a language in the workplace. We also notice that bilingualism peaks during the school years among Anglophones, but then drops off over the years as a result of a lack of continued exposure to French. This is largely because outside of Quebec, New Brunswick, and Ontario, the public opportunities to speak French in Canada are few and far between, with very small Francophone populations in the other provinces and territories. French is not the prominent language of the workplace or of the family outside of Quebec. And for this reason, despite studying in school and having a high level of bilingualism while being young, over the years, people lose this ability through a lack of practice. And let that be a lesson to you Vantage College students who are currently immersing yourself in English language education. It's important to learn this language now, but also to retain it later. Good luck. This is not true in Quebec, though. 
where Francophones and Anglophones are more likely to retain their bilingualism throughout their lives. And we will return to bilingual policies later in today's lecture. After the British conquest of Quebec in 1759, French became a second-class language, even within Quebec. Why did the French language survive in Canada, though, when compared to its disappearance in Louisiana in the United States after the end of French rule there, we might have expected a similar fate for French as a second-class language, which could very well have disappeared under the weight of increasing numbers of Anglophones who occupied central roles in government and business. So what explains the survival of the French language, especially through the 19th and early 20th centuries? There are at least three explanations. First, certain aspects of British colonial policy did grant special recognition to French culture specifically the recognition of the special status of the Roman Catholic Church in Quebec. Also, the use of the French Civil Code, which was used in Quebec's courts. The preservation of these two elements of the French system in 1774 was an aspect of the British recognition that its colonies were perhaps growing discontent with representation. This was two years before the American Revolutionary War was set to begin, and so Britain was in a conciliatory mood to try to soften the demands of the Quebecois by giving them special recognition. Secondly, the phenomenon that we discussed earlier of comparatively high birth rates in Quebec has been referred to historically as the revenge of the cradles. And so this high birth rate helped offset the diminishing proportion of Francophones in the Canadian landscape. Finally, and the topic that we're going to focus the most on in the coming slides, traditional French-Canadian nationalism. This was a nationalism that was dictated under the guidance of the Catholic Church. It was a nationalist ideology that was developed and predicated on the idea of survival survival of the French language, culture, and traditions, specifically its religious traditions. According to this ideology of survival, French Canada comprises a distinct nation within Canada, whose chief characteristics are Catholicism, and the French language. Remember last time when we talked about the fragment theory of political culture and we found that the fragment of French culture which emerged in French Canada was a pre-revolutionary, pre-liberal fragment of French society which was focused on traditional rights and traditional customs related to the Catholic Church and anti-liberal, anti-statist practices. And so French Canada had a special mission under this traditional nationalism, this ideology of survival. It had a special mission to remain faithful to its roots, faithful to the Catholic religion and to resist the lure of what was seen as a materialistic English Protestant pressure that was pushing down on the Quebecois and the French Canadians throughout the 18th and 19th centuries in Canada. Also, the character of the French Canadian people under this ideology of survival is that the Can French Canadian people are most secure in the province of Quebec, but by no means is French Canada restricted to the boundaries of the province. In other words, French Canada is defined by a shared traditional social and cultural characteristics, set of social and cultural characteristics, not by the territory of Quebec. So this, so this traditional nationalism represented by the church and its institutions and its social and cultural traditions was a nationalism rooted in 
this idea of survival and the survival of traditional customs and not necessarily a geographic nationalism centered on a certain territory. Let's expand more on this idea. Traditional nationalism did not equate the French Canadian nation with the borders of Quebec for two specific reasons. First, Catholicism was seen to be universal, not just within the borders of Quebec, but there were Catholics throughout Canada. And so in this way, the traditional nationalism was defined not just in Quebec, but by anyone who shared the traditional social customs of the Catholic Church. Second, traditional nationalism was pro-church, which made it also at the same time anti-statist. As we will see, the provision of social services was dominated until the 1960s by the Catholic Church. Social services and education were dominated by the church and its traditionalist clergy. And it wasn't until the 1960s that the province of Quebec, the state government of Quebec, began to assert itself in these areas. And so the traditional nationalism kept the state out of the provision of many social services, enlarging the role of the church in this area. And so under traditional nationalism then, the survival of the nation did not depend on the activities of the state to provide public goods, but rather it depended on the institutions that were seen as crucial to the continuation of the French language and the Catholic religion from generation to generation. And these traditional institutions that were going to keep the French language and the Catholic Church alive were seen to be the family, the school, and the parish. And so this was the center of the traditional nationalism, an ideology of survival of traditional Catholic and French language rights and customs perpetuated by the family, school, and parish. And this French Canadian nationalism was not constricted to a territory of Quebec, but rather to anyone who shared in the propagation of these Catholic, pro-church, anti-statist, traditional nationalisms. The traditional nationalism of French Canadians lasted a very long time. It wasn't until the mid 20th century that the difference between the traditional nationalism's ideology and the realities of the Quebec state began to become very clearly in direct conflict with one another. By the mid 20th century, the ideology of survival and the traditional nationalism was seriously out of touch with the economic and social reality of Quebec. By that, I mean that the province was no longer the rural, agrarian, traditional society that we see idealized in the traditional nationalism. But rather, what we can see is that the urban population of Quebec had already surpassed the rural population by 1921. And the nature of the Quebec economy had also dramatically changed during that period, such that farm workers were vastly outnumbered by manufacturing workers by the middle of the 20th century. And although Francophones accounted for 80% of the provincial population of Quebec, they did not control the wealth and they were shut out of the elite economic decisions that were being made for the province. All of these decisions were made by the Anglophone business elite, which occupied all of the important roles in the corporate culture of Quebec and also were able to make the economic decisions from a policy perspective that kept them in that role of dominance. And so the traditional nationalism then was not helping Quebec in terms of its economic and social progression in the 20th century. And so in the middle of the 20th century, an informal opposition to the status quo of the traditional nationalism dominated by the role of the church in state and social life 
this informal opposition began to emerge among professors, trade unionists and labor unionists, journalists, liberal politicians, and some reformers within the Catholic Church. And what united all of these different parts of the opposition was their opposition to what they called an unholy alliance of the church, the Anglophone business elite in Montreal, and the dominant political party, the Union Nationale, led by Maurice Duplessis. And the opposition contested or challenged the traditional elite's hold on power, as well as what they saw as a backwards characterization of French Canadian society and culture. The traditional nationalism, the opposition argued, was stuck in the past. And so the opposition cooked up a slogan that translated to catching up, which reflected the idea that most opposition members held, which was that Quebec needed to modernize and it needed to catch up with the rest of Canada and the rest of the rapidly advancing world. The leader of the Union Nationale, Maurice Duplessis, died in office in 1959. And in the 1960 election, the Liberal Party, led by Jean Lesage, won the provincial election in Quebec. And with the election of a Liberal Party of Quebec, we began, or the province began, the Quiet Revolution. The Quiet Revolution was a series of reforms that enlarged the power of Quebec, Quebec's provincial government and replaced the church's role in the provision of social services and education. The Quiet Revolution was a decade of reforms aimed at social, cultural, and economic policies that previously had been dominated by the church and would now become to be dominated by an enlarged provincial government and Quebec state. With the Quiet Revolution, the state in Quebec took over control of most social programs and the educational system that had previously been dominated by the church. It also acquired a new range of economic and social functions. See, under the old nationalism, the church controlled the social structures. The modern welfare state that was built by the provincial liberal government in the 1960s eliminated this role of the church. Furthermore, to reverse the domination of Quebec by English Canadians, the Quiet Revolution sought to take control of Quebec's economic and political destiny. It did this through a number of important actions. First off, there was a consolidation of the energy industry. Privately held energy companies were nationalized by the Quebec government, creating a very powerful energy company owned and operated by the province called Hydro-Quebec. The Liberal government also created an investment program, which today is the second largest pension program in all of Canada. These sorts of actions to gain more economic and energy independence within the province of Quebec was consistent with the 1962 slogan that the Liberal Party had for that election, which was masters in our own house. The quiet revolution and the new nationalism were trying to establish Quebec as masters in, its, in their own house rather than continuing to be at the behest or at rather than continuing to be beholden to the domination of Anglophone Canada. However, after the Liberals formed government in 1960, splits began to emerge within this group leading the Quiet Revolution and within this group adhering to the new nationalism. The main division was between Federalists, who were led by Pierre Trudeau, versus those who rather would have a special status for Quebec or independence and separation from the rest of Canada. The first leader of the brand new separatist party, Parti Québécois, in 1968 was René Levesque. And the PQ and Levesque 
would work toward a referendum on separation in 1980. The PQ supported separation, and this policy culminated in a 1980 referendum, which unlike the 1995 referendum, which was very, very closely contested, this was a clear defeat for those who wished to separate from Canada, with nearly 60% of voters in Quebec choosing to remain in the Canadian Federation. Our next learning objective is the comparison of Quebec's unilingual language policy with Ottawa's federal bilingual language policy. To begin, the Quiet Revolution and the identification of French Canada with the territory of Quebec, rather than the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church, had important consequences for language policy. Specifically, we need to understand Bill 101 because it had important and lasting effects in making Quebec a unilingual country in terms of its public accommodations and services. Under Bill 101, French is the sole official language of Quebec. This is subject only to Section 133 of the Constitution Act, which we called the British North America Act in our last lecture. And this requires that the province's legislature and courts be bilingual, but all other public services in Quebec are offered solely in French. The provincial and municipal bureaucracies, that is, work and deliver their services to individuals in the French language. Also, in terms of business and economy, Bill 101 establishes that all businesses with 50 or more employees must operate in the French language. This is consistent with signage laws at the time. Signage laws advertising businesses originally held that signs could only be in French. This was softened by the courts, including a Supreme Court case, which found that English had to be offered in some form of signage, even if only in ancillary form or inside of a business. So we typically saw on the outsides of businesses only French signage, with English relegated to a much smaller role in advertising and signage. And all of this, making businesses with 50 or more employees have, operate in French and including most signage in French, was consistent with the objective to ensure that French would become the working language in the private sector, to try to overcome the decades of Anglophone domination of the business elite and of private sector business in Quebec. Bill 101 had another impact, this one somewhat controversial. Bill 101 restricted access to English schools in Quebec. English speaking children could go to English language primary and secondary schools, but only if their parents had been educated in English in Quebec, or if they had a sibling already in English education. This had the clear impact of making most English speaking parents send their children to French language schools and all new immigrants also had to send their children to French speaking schools. This was consistent with the province's determination to protect the status of French, not only as a dominant language, but as the dominant language in Quebec. And so in this way, the intent of Bill 101's sections on schooling was to reverse what had previously been immigrants' overwhelming preference for the English language when they immigrated to Quebec. And this threatened to upset the linguistic balance in Quebec, especially in Montreal, which is a destination city for immigrants in Quebec. Unsurprisingly, a result of Bill 101 was a dramatic decline in the English language school system in the province of Quebec. The number of students there has dropped by about 150,000 since the 1970s, despite the fact that population growth has increased since that time. While the English language population of Quebec 
might be upset with Bill 101's impacts on English language education, it is clear that Bill 101 accomplished its two objectives, which were to increase the use of French in the economy in Quebec and stemming the decline of the Francophone share of the provincial population by enforcing French language education. In this way, the unilingual approach of Quebec was consistent with the quiet revolution movement to make Quebec masters of their own house and masters of their own language. Now let's turn our attention to the bilingual policy of the federal government in Ottawa. As the quiet revolution unfolded, the federal liberal government needed to offer Quebecers an alternative to the emerging new nationalist vision. This is because the federal government knew that it was facing an impending legitimacy crisis. If Canada, the Federation of Canada, could not offer Quebec an alternative to an independence sovereigntist movement, then it might risk losing Quebec for good. Because if Quebecers saw the provincial state as the only legitimate defender of their identity and language, eventually they would vote to separate and to leave the Canadian Federation, which was an outcome that Ottawa did not desire. As a result, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau had a solution, which was a policy of official bilingualism and the establishment of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism. This was a landmark event in Canadian history, and the impacts are still being felt today. Under official bilingualism, language rights are guaranteed to the individual and protected by national institutions. This is slightly different than other countries' language rights, which usually extend to the territory. For instance, the Belgian model of language rights gives those who speak Flemish specific language rights in Flanders, but not in Wallonia, where the French speakers dominate in that territory. Similarly, in the federal state of India, you have multiple federal states, each with their own titular ethnicity and each with their own official language within that state. However, in Canada, the bilingual approach of the federal government is that language rights are guaranteed not to a specific territory, like the unilingual policy in Quebec, but rather extended to the individual throughout the federal jurisdiction of the government. What this means is that the government needed to overhaul itself to change its image and its content and character from what had previously been an overwhelmingly Anglophone nature. This was because if the federal government, through a policy of bilingualism, was going to provide Quebec an alternative to a separatist independence movement, then that federal government had to truly not be perceived as alien to the Quebecers. This involved a number of changes, not just the declaration of an official bilingual policy. Specifically, official bilingualism also required a number of symbolic changes that would help the federal government and Quebecers exist in a more harmonious relationship with one another. This strategy to create public symbols that did not evoke Canada's British colonial past included a brand new flag. The previous flag, referred to as the Red Ensign, featured the Union Jack prominently. The new flag of the Canadian Maple Leaf is instantly recognizable around the world as one of the more famous flags. Furthermore, the national anthem, which used to be God Save the Queen, referring to the Queen of England, was replaced with O Canada as the official national anthem. In addition, there was a requirement that language in existing federal institutions, documents, and national celebrations be neutralized so as not to evoke a British colonial past. For this reason, the British North America Act of 1867 was officially retitled the Constitution Act of 1867. Similarly, the holiday of July 1st 
which previously was known as Dominion Day, which referred to the Dominion of Canada, which was the name of the British colonial holding in Canada after Upper and Lower Canada were united in 1841. So Dominion Day, which had existed, was replaced with the name Canada Day. However, it still should be remarked that Canada Day, while celebrated in Quebec, is not celebrated as enthusiastically and is not celebrated as commonly as it is across the other provinces in Canada. In fact, Canada Day, July 1st in Quebec, is probably more notable because it's moving day in Quebec. There was an old law that people could not be evicted during the snowy winter months, which meant that over the years and centuries in Quebec, people all began to move on a single day. That used to be May 1st, but in the mid-1970s, moving day was shifted because weather in May was still not so great in Quebec. It was shifted to July 1st. And so while the rest of Canada celebrates their patriotism and confederation on July 1st, 7% of people in Quebec are moving on that day. Continuing with our analysis of the bilingual language policy of the federal government in Ottawa, the Official Languages Act of 1969 created the Commissioner of Official Languages, which made sure to ensure that both official languages were represented in the public service in order to support the federal state's claim that it truly represented the interest of Francophones. If the federal government was going to reach out to Francophones, it clearly had to institute bilingualism within its own ranks immediately. Furthermore, the attractiveness of Quebec's independence option, its option to separate from the Canadian Federation, would be lessened by opening up the federal public service as a field of job opportunities for skilled Quebecers. Because remember, previously, highly skilled Quebecers had mostly been shut out of top career opportunities in the business sector and private sector in Quebec. And also, their French language skills did not give them access to the federal public service either. So now, the federal public service instituting bilingualism requirements would be able to attract more highly skilled Quebecers which could perhaps decrease their willingness to leave a union with the federal government, since the federal government was now becoming a more important job provider for the people of Quebec. In this way, the linguistic designation policy of bilingualism in the federal government works to the advantage of Francophones. As we will see on a graph on the next slide, in recent years, almost one-third of new jobs in the public service have gone to francophones, which is a, a far higher percentage than their share of the national population, which is at about 21%, if you recall. Furthermore, a clear majority of appointments to bilingual positions go to francophones. Let's take a look at the data. But before we do that, Let's finish up this slide. As we will see, outside of Quebec, the language of work in the federal public service is predominantly in English. What does this mean? It means that even though there is a bilingual requirement within all federal governments, whether it's in Quebec or outside of it, if it is a federal government office or institution, it must be bilingual. However, just because you employ people who speak both languages does not mean that French will be spoken in or around the office. It means that people who work for the federal government, of course, must greet people in both languages. If they are public client facing, they have to say, hello, bonjour. However, when they are working with one another within the federal government offices, the, labor, the language of meetings, the language in the hallway, the language in the office kitchen, the language of memos and emails is predominantly in English. So what we see is even though Francophone speakers have increased access to bilingual positions compared to Anglophones, 
we do see that the language of work outside of Quebec, even within bilingual federal ministries, is still predominantly in English. The reverse of this is true in Quebec, where federal ministries in Quebec, we see Anglophones, and again, let's be clear, the provincial language policy of Quebec is unilingual, which means that public services from the provincial government are delivered only in French. However, federal institutions in Quebec, so a federal government office in Quebec, has to provide services in, in both languages. But what we see is that Anglophones who work in federal offices in Quebec get the reverse of the situation that their Quebecois counterparts everywhere else experience. That is, they are allowed to speak English as part of their job of a federal worker, but the language of the workplace itself in Quebec is definitely French. Let's take a closer look at the data regarding bilingualism and representation in Canada. Let's look at the top half of this graph. The orange line that says 57.8% represents the share of the Anglophone Canadian population. That is to say, the people who report that English is their mother tongue. So just under 60% of the population of Canada is Anglophone. And what we see though, is that the share of federal public service, as well as the share of the managerial category of the public service is higher than the Anglophones overall representation. What this shows is that Anglophones are overrepresented slightly in the public service, both in terms of regular and managerial positions. However, if we look at the long picture of this, the long view of this, we see that that overrepresentation has decreased significantly over the last 50 years, where the purple and green dotted lines at the top are growing closer and closer to the orange line of the true percentage of the population that Anglophones represent. Also, if we look at the bottom half of this graph, we see that the Francophone population, while it has decreased overall as a share of the population, which we've mentioned multiple times today. We also see that because of the official bilingual approach of Ottawa to federal government practices, where all federal government business is conducted bilingually, we see also that more and more Francophones are getting these bilingual positions. Because now Francophones have gone from being underrepresented in the public service throughout most of the 20th century, and indeed in the years before that, dating all the way back to Confederation, now we see that although the Francophones only make up 21% of the population, they are represented by about, they represent 32% of those working in government. And so the Francophones are now also overrepresented, which is equalizing their historical disadvantage. Beyond establishing bilingualism as the official languages of the federal government, the federal government has also taken an activist role in championing language minority rights. Specifically, after the Official Languages Act was passed, Ottawa added two new elements to language policy in the 1970s. It increased financial support in two different ways. First, it increased financial support for legal challenges to provincial laws that were not respecting these new language rights. For instance, Supreme Court cases in Manitoba in 1975, 1979 and 1985 were funded by the federal government and which eventually overturned provincial laws that had restricted French language rights. Second, Ottawa also increased financial support for French immersion education throughout English Canada. Although, as we mentioned before, over half of these immersion schools are in Ontario. Let's say a little more about French immersion. French immersion in English Canada is increasingly popular. This is perhaps driven by the perception that parents have that bilingualism will help their children get good jobs but what we see is the evidence doesn't really support this. Outside of Quebec, 
there is no evidence that bilingualism is actually an asset in the private sector. Of course, in terms of public sector employment, especially in the Canadian federal government, bilingualism can definitely give an individual a leg up. However, in the private sector, what we see is that English is still the language of business everywhere that is not Quebec. And so for this reason, we don't see that French immersion is clearly connected to better employment outcomes for those who are immersed. However, other people point out that some studies show that people who do French immersion end up making more money than people who don't. However, we need to take a critical eye to this sort of data, says the author of our textbook. Brooks argues that the reflection of people who go to French immersion and make more money is actually a self-selection effect. That is to say, those who go to French immersion are more typically the children of middle and high income parents. And what we see is that more generally, immersion or not, the children of middle and high income parents typically make more money than those born into low income families. And so French immersion might not actually be the causal effect here that is promoting higher gains among in the employment sector among those who actually study French. This is not to argue that French immersion is not valuable. Of course it is. Instead, we're trying to, to train in you as aspiring political scientists, the ability to tell a causal story and to understand causal factors, but also to take a critical eye to correlations that might not have causal force behind them. We'll be looking at all sorts of causal relationships in Canadian politics as this semester unfolds, but we also, but we always have to be careful about drawing clear lines of cause and effect. And in the case of French immersion schools, we don't see clear evidence that success in French immersion is tied to success in private sector employment. Our final learning objective today concerns the issue of Quebecois separatism. Is this issue still salient in the contemporary Canadian political landscape? Or is this issue settled and over? If you recall, the 1995 referendum on Quebec independence was a very closely run race, with the no vote barely outgaining the yes vote by one percentage point. However, in 2016, a widely reported poll found that 82% of Quebec respondents agreed with the statement, ultimately, Quebec should stay in Canada. 21 years separated that poll from the very close referendum in 1995. And clearly, in those 21 years, public opinion has shifted, with more and more Quebecers hoping to stay in Canada rather than nursing dreams of sovereignty and independence. Furthermore, in the 2018 provincial election, the Parti Québécois won only 17% of the popular vote. Remember, the PQ is the provincial political party that formed once the Quiet Revolution revealed a split between federalists like Pierre Trudeau and separatists like René Levesque. The separatist PQ contested its first election in 1970, and it didn't do very well in that election because it was a brand new political party. However, in 2018, the PQ didn't have that excuse, and the 17% of the popular vote that it won was its, was its lowest result since that very first election in 1970. This is another piece of evidence suggesting that the party of Quebecois independence and separation is polling lower than it has in decades. And if we turn our attention to the federal scene, we see that the federal bloc Quebecois, which is the federal Quebec party, saw its seat count in the federal parliament in Ottawa drop significantly from 2008 to 2015. However, we have seen that seat count rebound slightly 
with the most recent federal election in 2019. Please note the typo on this slide. The most recent federal election was in 2019, not in 2018. And we're going to take a look at the four elections and the electoral returns of the Bloc Québécois in those most recent four elections, the 2008, 2011, 2015, and 2019 federal elections. Let's take a look at those now. In 2008, we start with the BQ with 49 seats in Parliament. Stephen Harper's Conservatives had a minority government with 143 seats. The Liberal Party with 77 seats was the official opposition, and the Bloc Québécois was the third most popular party in the Parliament. However, in the next election, the BQ saw its fortunes reverse. In 2011, Stephen Harper transformed his minority government into a majority government, and the New Democrat Party achieved its first ever historical status as the official opposition. This was the first time that a party other than the Liberals or the Conservatives had formed the official opposition. However, it came at a cost, and much of that cost was losses by the Bloc Québécois in Quebec. And what we see here is an enlarged picture in both elections of the South Quebec Montreal region, Quebec City, and Gatineau. Please note that in that Ottawa Gatineau series of writings, the only one we should pay attention to for Quebec's purposes is that top flat looking writing because that is Gatineau, which is on the Quebec side, I believe. Take that with a grain of salt because I'm now recalling that Gatineau might be on both sides of the border, but we'll look into that. That is a border town with Quebec at the very least. So what we see here is that from 2008 to 2011, support for the Bloc in Quebec nearly evaporated, with the Bloc losing almost all of its 49 seats and reaching an all-time low of four seats. How has it done in the 10 years since? Well, what we see is that in 2015, the Bloc did slightly better, winning 10 seats up from its total of four in 2011. However, the real story was the Liberal Party of Justin Trudeau winning the majority away from the Conservative Party, the Conservatives being relegated to official opposition and the New Democrats falling into third. The Bloc Québécois was a distant fourth and somewhat, seemingly, increasingly irrelevant in the national parliament. But what about our most recent election in, once again, in 2019, not 2018? Apologies for the typo. Well, what we actually see is an increased result for the Bloc Québécois. And so we see that the Bloc was able to take back many seats from the NDP and from the Liberals, in order to achieve 32 seats. Now remember, in 2008, we started with 49 seats for the Bloc Québécois, which bottomed out to a low of four in 2011, and now has slowly regained back to 32 seats. However, we still see that the Bloc and its vision of a sovereigntist association or a separate Quebec is decreasing in salience and decreasing in popularity not only in the provincial scene with the Parti Québécois, but also clearly in terms of its national electoral returns, the Bloc Québécois has lost favor as well. However, is the death of the separatism movement really true? People have been speaking about the decline in support for separatism for some time now but it is possible that these analyses are overstated and perhaps the resurgence of the BQ in the 2019 election could be a precursor to an even larger success in the election that is most likely to be called sometime in 2021. An important continuing source of tension 
within the province and which could lead to renewed calls for separatism is the language situation in Montreal. Despite the efforts of a unilingual Quebecois language policy within the province, the city of Montreal has become significantly more English speaking over the past couple of decades. Despite the fact that immigrants must send their children to French language schools, we have still seen, in the workplace at least, French appears to be losing some ground. The predominant use of French fell from 72 to 69% over a 10 year period from 2006 to 2016. This is a small decrease to be sure, but any decrease in the use of French sets off alarm bells for Quebecois politicians and defenders of language rights. At the same time, an increasing number of workers are using both French and English on a regular basis at work. Across Quebec and taking into account uncertainty as to future levels of immigration, especially considering the border closures that Canada has experienced over the last year and the continuing uncertainty about when the borders will open up and from where immigration will be allowed in a post-pandemic world, we should note that the share of the population with French as their mother tongue is expected to drop from about 79% in 2011 to about 70% in 15 years from now in 2036. This steady decline in the prevalence of French being spoken in Quebec and across the country is concerning to those who would defend French language rights. At the same time, French-English bilingualism is expected to increase from 43% in 2011 to over 50% in 2036. How should we interpret these results? On the one hand, a continuing decrease in the use of French, despite specific ever efforts at the provincial and federal level to promote the French language, but at the same time, increasing levels of bilingualism, perhaps again, as a result of those federal efforts to promote both languages. So how do we interpret these results? Well, the conclusion we derive very much determines on our perspective. If we are judging this by the standard that French ought to be predominant and ought to be used exclusively in Quebec, well then these projections cause a lot of alarm for Quebec's unilingual approach to promoting its language rights. On the other hand, if the growth of bilingualism is the standard that we're going to use to judge these conclusions, then Ottawa's language policies could clearly be succeeding in promoting the increased use of bilingualism. Through it all, it'll be interesting to see whether the decrease of French renews efforts to drive a separatist party or a separatist politics in Quebec. Because even if the Bloc Québécois and the Parti Québécois rebound, it's not clear that separatism will be the political platform they use to do it. If separatism is going to return, it will be because the French Canadians believe that their cultural identity and that their language is under attack within the Canadian Federation. Since the 1970s, the federal government has made it its, one of its most important tasks to make sure that French Canadians don't feel this way. Nonetheless, despite the federal government's efforts, the Quebec the Quebecois population very nearly voted to separate in 1995 and held another referendum that was less successful in 1980. Whether there will be a third referendum on a Quebecois separation in the future of Canadian politics is unknown. At the present moment, it seems unlikely, but the fact that tensions between Francophone and Anglophone Canadians have persisted for centuries it would be unwise to say in too strong of terms that separatism is well and truly dead. All right, let's do a lecture reflection assignment. Based on this lecture material, as well as the assigned reading from our textbook, Stephen Brooks's Canadian Democracy, ninth edition, 
and we were assigned chapter 14 this week. Please write a seven to 10 sentence response to the following question. Should Quebec be an independent state? We don't get to vote in any referendums as international students, but we can still debate the merits of this issue. Separatism may be in decline, but it certainly isn't dead. And so I want to hear from all of you after reading the textbook and after listening to today's lecture, what do you think? Should Quebec be an independent state? Make sure to base your arguments on your understanding of the course materials. Also, be sure to use your own words and practice careful paraphrasing so that we can be successful in all of our writing endeavors this semester. Please submit your lecture reflection to turnitin.com by Wednesday, January 20th, before midnight. Keep in mind that this week is a bit special because we have two lecture reflections due on Wednesday. We didn't have any tutorials in week one, which is why we have the week one and week two lecture reflections due on the same day. From here on out, we will only have one lecture reflection per week. And if you still haven't signed up for turnitin.com, please be sure to do so. See the instructions in the course syllabus on page six. Next week, what's on tap? Our next lecture is on indigenous politics in Canada. Once again, this is a chapter that the author of our textbook put near the very end of the book, chapter 16. I think it's way too long to wait for chapter 16 to address this crucial issue in Canadian politics. We will talk all about indigenous politics in the various forms they have taken over the centuries, and we will understand one of the last crucial groups that we have yet to study in great depth that make up a crucial and significant part of the Canadian mosaic. Until then, be safe, be well, and shoot me a line over instant message or email if you have any questions about today's material. All right, everyone, take care, and I'll talk to you soon.